<laughs> so today our topic is opening doors, and I think it's a really perfect topic because of where we are sort of culturally and also as a race in evolution. Um, I'm going to start with a some with an idea from Stanislav Grof. Do you know? Does anybody know who Stanislav Grof is? Okay, he's a, a Czech psychiatrist who did a lot of research on psychedelics, and. Um, one of the things, interesting things that the ancestors told me a couple weeks ago when I was thinking about this talk is they said, you know, psychedelics teach you how to die. And I was like, wow, you're so right, they do. And so then when I, I, I knew about Groff because he was also one of the people that I studied when I was working on my book because he was kind of a forefront, he was at the forefront of emotional intelligence before it ever became a buzzword. Um, so he has this uh, four stages of birth process, it's called. So stage one is called uterine bliss. Okay, so this is, has everything the fetus no, needs. It grows without limit. There's no struggle. There's no effort, right? And so if you think about that, like for me as a baby boomer, the 50s was like the womb, right? Like we had this kind of idyllic upbringing where we had so much freedom. You know, we would be out until you know, the str until it was dark out and my mom would be calling us to come home. We'd be gone all day. There was no fear that somebody had kidnapped us. There was no fear that we were off doing drugs or, you know, we just sort of grew up in this idyllic womb. And I think many of us yearn to go back to that time, but don't know how to get there. And we can't, because you can't ever go back into the womb, right? Stage two is when we begin to grow against the limits of the womb, okay? So there's pressure, and the pressure's coming from everywhere, and there doesn't appear to be any way out. We keep trying to find a comfortable position, but it just becomes this increasingly intolerable situation. This pressure that we can't get comfortable with, it's, 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 it's hampering us, it's encumbering our movements, and it's uncomfortable. Does that sound like a place we might have been recently? <laughs> like maybe in the last couple of decades, right? We're starting to move into the limits of our womb. We're starting to find the edges of our existence, the edges of what we believe to be true in our reality, okay? Stage three begins when the cervix opens and the baby begins a journey through the birth canal. And this is the hardest part because it's that contraction, that squeezing, that pushing, that intense pressure, that intense pain, right? And we don't know where we're going. We have no idea what's on the other side. None. Zero. All we know is that this unbearable pressure we've been feeling for quite some time has now pushed us into to something that's even scarier because we're moving, but we're moving in a way that's uncomfortable, that's frightening, and we don't know where we're going. I would say that's kind of where we've been the last couple years. <laughs> Stage four, where we're poised now, is the emergence into a new world. There's no going back. And I think this is the key truth that people are having a hard time accepting around the world. There is no going back to the way that we were before. We cannot. It's impossible. And so what I see a lot with my clients, with my friends, with my family, is I see this intense fear that comes when you're moving through the birth canal and you don't know where you're going. You don't know where you're going to end up. And as an emotional intelligence expert, what I will tell you is that the reality that you end up when you come through that birth canal and you come out the bottom and you make that final push, that reality is going to be directly influenced by your feelings right now. So if you are fearful, you're going to attract a reality to you that's going to keep you afraid. If you're angry, you're going to attract a reality to you that is going to keep you angry. And that's why it's so critically important right now for us to understand how powerful our emotional body is and its ability to manipulate reality. Emotion is the great attractor. 
How many people have ever dreamed of something with such passion and over and over and over and then it appeared exactly how you dreamed it, right? That's the power of emotion. It's that repetitive feeling and visualizing of what it is that you desire, okay? And so your desire, we have been taught that desire is a dirty word. Desire is what creates your reality. And I love that song by Pink where she said, where there is desire, there's going to be a flame. Where there is a flame, you're bound to get burned. But just because you're burned doesn't mean you're going to die. You got to get up and try, right? I love that song. It was playing on the way here and I was like, yes, that's exactly right. So just know that there are numerous cultural pressures on you to be afraid and angry. There are numerous cultural pressures on you to blame someone or something else for your discomfort. There's numerous cultural pressures to convince you that desire is selfish or dirty, okay? And none of that is true. The reality of it is the pressure we're feeling is just the birth canal. That's what we're feeling, and, and it comes in waves, right? That's how birth works. You get these really strong contractions and pushing, and, and then there's a period of grace where you get to take a breath. So just remember, if you watch your life right now, you'll see that's exactly how it's going. You'll have these periods of intense pressure where it's all of a sudden, all your deadlines are due at once, and, and people aren't following through with what they said they would, and there's just all this stuff going wrong. And then you move into a period of grace for a short time, and then you start over. Has anybody had that experience lately? <laughs> I had to remind myself earlier this week that like, I don't know, five planets were in retrograde or something like that. I'm like, oh my God, there is a great meme that said, this is the most retrograde retrograde I've ever retrograded. <laughs> and I was like, yes, that's so true. That's so true. Uh, I'm used to being able to manipulate reality with my emotions. And what that means is I'm used to getting what I want. And when I don't get what I want because of retrograde or some other external thing, or I'm trying to manipulate reality for someone else, and they're not really on board with it, I get very frustrated. And then I have to sit down and say to myself, where are you spending your energy? Um, do you have permission from the people that you know, you're working with here to create a different reality? Do you have their permission 100%? Do you have their buy-in? And if it's a no, then I have to back down and say, you know what, you need to let me know when you're ready to move on, and then we'll do that. I just have to get some water. Okay. So, I'm going to talk to you today from that place right before that final push, that final push that pops you out into the new reality, okay? Because I think that's where we are. I think as a race, we are standing on this incredible point of evolution where we can collectively determine that we are going to have a conscious birth for each of us and also for the entire human race. And we need it. We do need an ascension. We need to shift the way that we think. We need to um, remove the programming that has taught us to be afraid, that, is, uh, that has caused us to be addicted to authority. We are addicted to being told what to do because we have been taught since school, since kindergarten, if not earlier, to follow the rules, to be a good kid, to be a nice person, to not do or feel what's going through your body, but instead to, cut, to hold that passion back and temper it so that you don't make waves and you don't make people around you uncomfortable. And I'm telling you that it is time to reclaim that power. It's time to reclaim your passion. It's time to reclaim your warrior energy. It's time to reclaim your dream energy. One of the things that I've been thinking about a lot is how have we been convinced to give up our magic? You never hear the t anybody talking about magic unless you're in places like this. Most people don't even believe in magic anymore, and yet every one of us as children was connected to some kind of magical world. 
Some of us remember it, some of us don't. Some of us are still connected to that magical world. I've been working with nature spirits for 25 years and they have helped me stay connected to that ability to manipulate reality for the good. It's, and, and you can manipulate reality for the bad as well which we see all around us every single day, and we're part of that manipulation. If we don't understand how our own emotions work to create reality, then we can be used to create the reality that somebody else wants. We can become unwilling pawns in someone else's chess game. And that's why I have for 20 years been saying you've got to understand how you create through emotion. How many people have heard you create, your own you create your own reality? How many people are kind of pissed off because they don't want to believe that they've created the bad stuff in their life? When I first was introduced to that concept of creating your own reality, I was a mess. <laughs> I was really a mess. I was in the film business. I was in this incredibly intense um, job. And, you know, after a long run of loving it and, ha you know, because I loved it, it was magical for me. And because it was magical, I could create something good. But after about 17 years, my magic was gone because I wasn't feeding that part of myself. I didn't understand it. And so when my magic left, it just became hard and it got harder and harder and harder and harder until I was on the floor sobbing every morning when I woke up going, I don't want to go to work today. I don't want to do this. Please don't make me do this. And so then I was like, why would I create... Am I a masochist? Why would I create this reality that's so hard and uncomfortable and makes me so miserable? And then I, under, and then I found out about imprinting. So imprinting happens usually before the age of five. Imprinting is when you have an emotional experience that's very powerful. It could be a trauma or it can be joyful, but it's an emotional experience that blasts your physical body with an idea and then it stays there. So let's say that as a kid, you hear your parents fighting every night about money, and they're violent, they're screaming, they're throwing things, they're blaming each other for lack of resources, and somehow you take that in as a little child because you're not really, you don't have all the information. You take it in that relationships and money don't mix. That's just one imprint you could, you could take in. There's many, but I'll just pick that one. So in your psyche now, relationships and money don't go together because there's always going to be fighting about it. So maybe you decide that you're never going to be in a relationship. Maybe you decide that if you get in a relationship, your money is completely separate from each other. Whatever you do with that, that's going to impact your ability to create your reality consciously. And so when we have imprints that are in the way of us creating our ideal future, we have what I call a do-over. And a do-over is where you create the original trauma and you do it over again. Because now you have a different way to go through it. For many of us though, as soon as we get into that do-over, it triggers the original feeling, which is generally has fear attached to it. And so we look to get away from it. Instead of going, saying, okay, here I am having a do-over. If we learned this language of do-over, we'd just be like, oh, I'm in a do-over. This is not really happening right now. It just feels like it's happening. Certain things have happened to make me feel this way again, but the reality is not the same. And I am a powerful creator right now, so I can move through this in a different way. You never have a do-over until you have the tools to do it over different. Think about that. You never have a do-over of a trauma until you have the tools to do it differently. And then that shifts it. That takes that imprint out of your body, puts it in your conscious mind, and you do it differently, and then you've broken the pattern. That energy is now freed up for conscious... Um, the word just flew out of my head. Uh, Creation, thank you. <laughs> conscious creation. So conscious create, the more personal power you have, the easier it is for you to create 
the reality that you would thrive in. Personal power comes from a number of things, but the biggest thing in my opinion is freeing up old imprints that are holding emotional energy from your past and are not allowing you to go forward. And that's why when you, a lot of people as they age, they sort of, their energy begins to fragment. They lose their power and suddenly they become victims because they don't have the capacity to actually create what they want. They become victims to what's going on around them. And I, I don't know about you, but I know lots and lots of people like that. And it's very hard when it's somebody you love. It's very hard to watch somebody go through that, especially for me, because I want to change them. I want to fix them. <laughs> and I've had to learn that it is not my place to fix anybody, that all I can do is lead by example. Um, that was a hard lesson for me. <laughs> okay, so... Let's go back to magic for a second. Um, magic has many definitions, and uh, so I'm just gonna give you mine. For me, magic is the ability to influence reality in such a way, I'm a big believer in the multiverse theory, you know, that there's an infinite number of realities. And I believe that emotional intelligence, true emotional intelligence, can allow you to jump timelines to, to allow you to jump realities. So if you're in a reality that you're not happy with, you have the capacity to move to a different one. And that's a lot of what my book is about. It's like really simple steps of how to get from A to B. My, so my definition of magic is the ability to influence what reality I'm in at any given moment. That's to me true magic. And I've had the luxury in the last two years, uh, because of all the shutdowns and the lockdowns and all the stuff that's been going on, we've had a lot of time by ourselves, haven't we? <laughs> we've had a lot of time to do some internal work. And so it was a good time for me to really look at, um, I am not, I, I found myself at the beginning in the same place as everybody else, full of fear, full of anger, full of frustration, full of, you know, um, what's gonna happen, full of fear of authority. Oh my goodness, fear of authority was huge. So 2020 for me was all about addressing all of those things, really getting right with my emotions, sitting down, um, anytime I was feeling overwhelmed and just writing it down. And there's a worksheet in the book, in the back of the book, that's really, that I developed, that's really great for that. It just says, you know, my fear says this, my anger says this, my grief says this. And so it's an, it's an opportunity for you to open the door to your emotions and say, what, why are you feeling this way? Okay, what is my grief saying? And grief always comes before change. Grief is the act of, of letting go and making room for something new. So I grieved in 2020 like crazy. I grieved the loss of friends, I grieved the loss of family, I grieved the loss of, my, both my parents died, I grieved the loss of many, many things in 2020. But most of all, I grieved the loss of a way of life that I knew I would never go back to. And that left me then in a place of, oh my God, what's next? Where am I going? Why can't I get any traction moving forward? And it was because I didn't really understand that I wasn't ready to come out of the birth canal yet. I really didn't have a good plan or a really good vision of where I wanted to be. I had ideas and I wrote them down, but I didn't really have a coherent world that I wanted to go into. So then I started writing down, okay, what kind of world would I love to live in? And I just started writing down, what am I doing with my neighbors? What am I doing with my family? How are we coexisting? If nobody has to work, then what are we doing to feel that we have purpose in life? And it was interesting because I had to really address all of those imprints I got growing up about being productive. What does our culture value? How do you become a good citizen, right? There's so many imprints that we have about our value is related to how much money we make. And if you take that out of the equation, what's left? I was lost. Okay, well, um, so then my first thought was, okay, I would have to be in service. 
But isn't that just another idea about my value has no value unless I'm doing something for someone else? I had to find a place where my value was simply being who I was. And that took a long time. That took months. But I got there. Um, so, one of the things that I started to do is write down, as I became more and more clear about the world that I wanted to go to, that I wanted to live in, the kinds of people I wanted to engage with, the kinds of activities I wanted to be doing, um, I began to make lists of ways that I could start doing that right now. How can I, so here's the reality, we're walking along, and in this direction, like, is the fear and the control and the, you know, uh, all, of the, all of the stuff that's going around on social media that makes people terrified. That's a path. I'm not going down that path. So I was like, I'm going down this path. Okay, this is the path I want to go down. All right, so, so I'm here. Here's the path I want to be on. What can I do? every single day that could take me one step closer to this path. So one of the things I decided to do is I take, we have a cat that likes to go for a walk around the block every day. So I take a bag and I pick up trash. It's a small thing, but it's a thing nonetheless that takes me over to this world, which is all the trash has been cleaned up in this world. Okay, there is no trash because people have far, far too much respect for their environment to ever throw something on the ground. So in this direction, I'm moving a little bit at a time, picking up trash. Um, and, you know, for those of you who have seen me talk before, you know that I'm very much about audience interaction. So I'm going to be asking you all to volunteer some ideas about the world that you want to live in and how you could get there, what small action could you take to get there? So, oh, I should probably mention this because it's in your handout. If you don't make time for your wellness, you'll be forced to make time for your illness. That struck me big because my sister has cancer this year, she got cancer this year. And, um, and I've been one of her caretakers, and so we've had to have many conversations about death, dying, what's next, and also um, how do we use illness as <clears throat> an informant. I have long-term Lyme disease, and when I was diagnosed with Lyme disease, uh, which was about six years ago, I went home and I contacted the deva of Lyme. Devas are the nature intelligences that I was telling you about. Every single living thing on this planet has a deva that governs its role here. So I contacted the deva of Lyme and I said, I don't know how to handle this because we can't coexist. You will kill me eventually and I don't want to kill you, but I don't understand how we can coexist. And the Lyme said to me, here's the thing, Kat. You have a very bad habit of saying yes when you should say no. And so we're here to hold you down. When you overcommit, we're going to take you down. And they do. I'm like three days in bed if I overcommit. And they said, when you can manage your time wisely by yourself, we'll be gone. So Lyme disease has now become my informant. If I have a relapse, it's because I've overcommitted to something for the wrong reason. And so if we see illness as an informant, we have a better way of moving through it and also moving through it with a recommitment to our health, both physical, spiritual, emotional, and mental. Okay, um, so statements of action from the... So, so first I want to ask people, uh, if you could tell me one thing about the world you long to live in that's different from this world. If you don't raise your hand, I'll call on you. And she'll have the microphone, so we'll ask you to wait until the microphone comes. Who has a... Who would like to... I know you're just itching to. <laughs> <laughs> so what's I, I know you <laughs> what what is the 
different, what is one different thing in the world that you long to be in from the world today? Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to live in a world that natural. Natural, it's my truth. Truth with yourself, truth with Mother Earth, truth with your children. Okay. I, I'm just asking you to say one thing that's different. So if it's nature, then what's different in your world, the new world? How are people with nature in the new world that they are not in nature here? Uh, first of all, looking under your feet. Under feet. Even small plants, small herbs have conscience. Yes. And this is small herbs, for example, dandelions, my favorite subject this year, dandelions. Don't kill dandelions. Okay. So they won't bring you good. Since. Okay. So, thank you. So in this new reality, people don't kill plants. Okay. That's, see, think about that for a minute. Think about how easily, I had to drop out of several gardening groups that I was in because of the language of war that people used to talk about weeds, Japanese beetles. It was like, burn those effers, kill them. And I was like, are you serious? We're talking about an insect or we're talking about a plant. Like, there's no need to get so, but people get so violent. And it's because we have been trained to be violent in our emotions against anything that makes us uncomfortable. And we have to break that training. We have to break that imprinting. That's on us to break. Okay. One, one more. Let me, let me just get it to a few more people. Did you have? Okay. Yeah. I would love to live in a world where every person feels loved and valued just for being themselves. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and remember these because I'm going to come back to you. I would like to live in a world where everyone isn't so afraid. Thank you. Thank you. That would be a world of trust, correct? People often say it's either fear or love, right? Have you heard that? It's a terrible saying because love is not a feeling. Love is a field. It's either you live in fear or trust. Trust brings you to the field of love, right? Love is not a feeling. It's a field. It's an electromagnetic field. And when you're in the field of love, everybody knows what it feels like to be in love, right? But we think that that's attached to a person. It's not. It's just that because we have this relationship or this connection with a person, our hearts open and suddenly we find ourselves in the field of love and we like that feeling so much that we do everything we can to try to recreate it and we get bogged down because we think it's connected to the person, a person. So trust or fear, it's fear or trust. Okay, who's next? Hi. So I'd like to live in a world where I feel more supported and the examples are like, I, when I didn't feel well, I listened to the energy healing doctor's summit and I listened to it five hours a day because you know, my energy field just said, you're gonna be laying down and fortunately it's on Zoom and another weekend, I did a healing touch uh, seminar, two full days on Zoom. And I would love to be able to share my excitement and my enthusiasm and have people respond and go, hey, that's great, we're really happy for you, and tell me some more about it. But I currently am in a family where I do best if I don't talk about it. And okay, thank you, that was really good. That. I'm gonna come back to each of you in a minute, once we've kind of gone through and everybody's had their thing to say, I'm gonna come back to each of you who spoke. So, Jay. Uh, I look forward to living in a world where there is complete transparency. Thank you. And do you notice that Jay said, I look forward to living in that world. Um, I've been very bad about saying want during this talk, and that's a word that in conscious language I normally wouldn't use. So thank you for um, upping the vibration of I look forward to. And see, what you're doing when you say that is you're actually putting out an emotional vibration that says, I look forward, meaning I already know it's there and I already know I'm coming there, right? I want says I am separate from it. But I'm looking forward to it says I'm on my way. <laughs> Thank you. I'm looking forward Yay! to... 
feeling free and everyone feeling free to do and be whatever speaks to them. Excellent. Thank you. I'm looking forward to... Is this on? Yes. I'm looking forward to really feeling a sense of community. And we just had a tornado go through our neighborhood and everybody helped each other and it was just the most uplifting experience. And I want to live in that kind of world all the time. Lovely. <laughs> right here. Hi, um, I like you take walks and I bring a little bag with me and pick things up, but um, I'm not as pure as you are because uh, I call it my asshole bag. Because every time I pick something up, I'm cursing the idiot that did it. Ah. So it's not a pure thing I'm doing. I'm not going, oh, I'm cleaning the environment. No, I'm getting angry. <laughs> so right. That's the one thing I would change. It's very interesting that you Okay. Well, and that's, it's great. Like you just self-corrected your, you know, your uh, behavior for yourself that uh, wasn't serving you. Like picking up trash is, is a great service. Doing it with anger sort of defeats the, right? It doesn't give you, um, doing it with anger, and this is another thing we've been so programmed to be angry about anything and everything that's, you know, that, and it doesn't serve us because it takes away the magic of doing the act. The act of picking up trash is very magical because you're sending out a message to Mother Earth and she's responding to you. It's like, I'm respectful, I'm cleaning up. When we're doing it with anger, we don't, we're not open to hearing to getting back from her. You're not getting the juice back from her. So thank you for sharing that. That was a great example. Anybody else? Yep. I'm looking forward to playing joyfully with others. Ah, yes. Here's to playing joyfully. All right, anybody else have a, I'm looking forward? One more, okay. Because then we're going to move into the next part. I'm, I'm looking forward to the pandemic being something we talk about in the past tense. <laughs> well, okay, so let's talk about that in conscious language terms. One of the things I learned when I first started studying conscious language was you never put in an affirmation something that you don't want in your future. So um, I'm going to... I'm not going to ask you to reframe that at the moment. I'm going to wait till we come back. Uh, I, but I'd like you to think about that. Okay. I, I did think about it. I was thinking about saying I'm looking forward to living in a healthy world because I've had that on my vision board since 2020. But I feel like it, I want something more specific. So, <laughs> and that can be okay for um, uh, as a step. But again, you're. F You've given pandemic power in your future. You've given pandemic power in your dream. And I don't know that that's what you want exactly. Okay. So um, one thing you could say is I look forward to living in a world where people are healthy until they die because they understand the relationship between the earth, their body, their emotions, their spirit, and their health. I know that's a long one, but it sort of encompasses the world that you're looking for. And that's a world I look forward to is, as well, is I look forward to living in a world full of healthy people who take care of themselves and take time to be healthy on every level. You know, they've, they're, they're not just taking care of their body by eating well, but they're taking care of their spirit, they're taking care of their emotions, they're taking care of their thoughts. That's a world that I'm choosing to go to. So, thank you. Okay. Now, my next question is for those of you who gave an example, what are you gonna do, what, what could you do, what one step could you take to go towards that world. So let's start with you, because you were first. So you want to live in a world where everybody respects nature. What can you do, what one thing can you do every day that will get you closer to that reality? I already doing that sp spontaneously. For example, this summer I saw my neighbor start to spray again, uh -huh. like print, you know, print it. Uh -huh. uh, so, they have print to spray, everybody do it with the other, monkey do it with the other monkey do it, right? So, monkey spraying around, I will do spray too, because I'm lazy, because I'm sick, I don't, I, I don't want pull. So, 
I start to talk with him about how good is then the lines for benefits for health, for his health, okay. because he's not a healthy person, how it's good. And plus I tell him, you know what, I wake up in the morning, I go outside, enjoy natural spring, fresh air, and suddenly I smell bad stinky chemical. It's common. You know, you not live separate from me. You just live next to me. You cannot spray arrow what has come to me. So did he change? Did he stop? Yeah, changing? okay. It, it, so, slow, slow change. I little bit push people. Yeah, I'm that, sorry. And, and I'm only talking. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. That, and I'm only talking about one little step. So she took one little step by talking to her neighbor who was spraying chemicals and saying, you know, it's not healthy for you as well as the rest of us, as well as the planet, to be spraying that, and her neighbor listened. And so if one person can think twice about an old habitual pattern that they're unconscious of doing because you mentioned it, then think about if a thousand of us each had that conversation, and then 10,000 of us, and then 10 million of us each had that conversation. Okay, tell me again what your world was? I look forward to that world where every person is, feels loved and valued for just being themselves. And, okay, and, and how, how, what step can you take to move you to that world? I can think, I, have, I try to practice two things, one internal, one external. Uh, the internal is that anytime some preconceived notion comes up that prevents me from feeling that way about anybody, I try to consciously give that away and just remember that they can they should be loved and valued regardless of all that other stuff the other one is um, kind of um, interpersonal and in that i try and it's and i fail a lot but i try to always recognize the other person you know in our daily life there's a lot of interactions where we barely interact so just recognize them as people perhaps looking them in the eye and just acknowledging them Excellent. Can I may, I? may I ask you one more question? Are you giving yourself the same? Uh, are you giving that to yourself first? I think I am. Okay. Thank you. Because this is, again, one of those ideas that we've been brought up with about being in service, is that your being in service to some other thing, some other person, some other group, some other idea is more holy or is more special than being in service to yourself. And what I will tell you is that you have to be in service to yourself first before you can make any impact on the world around you. And, th and that brings up a really good point. Let me just say this about um, impacting the world around you. 2020, 2021 taught me, the ancestors told me at the beginning of the year, they're like, you're done teaching, it is not your job to change anybody's mind. Every bit of information that anybody needs is out there. So just back off, stop trying to change people, stop trying to educate them, and just focus on what is the world you want to go to. And so we're at this moment of birth right now, this singularity where everything's possible, and what you want to do is you don't want to influence the world. You want to pull your energy back and use it as an attractor to attract the world that you are looking forward to moving into. And you are not going to have a lot of the people that are in your life now in that future. That's why we grieve. Does that make sense? Okay. Who is next back there? So I wanted to live in a... I, Intend or what? what looking I'm forward. looking forward to living in a world where I'm feeling more free and people are free to be and do whatever speaks to them. And what came up for me was just doing things that make me feel vulnerable. So I'm going to do those intuitive things that come to mind that might make me feel a little vulnerable. <laughs> do they also make you feel free? Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. because that, see, this is the other thing. If that's the world that you want to go to, then you act as though you are already living in there, which means you are already acting free. And then you attract people who want to go to that world with you, right? This is how emotion works. So when you're standing grounded in your truth and you're forging forward, people are like, ooh, I want to go where she's going. <laughs> okay, so be free. 
Okay. Be free. I, I said that I would like to live in a community that is really um, a community where people help each other and care about each other. Um, personally, I, I have done some community building in my community, my local community, and, but how, how does, what, what am I supposed to ask about myself? Um, what steps could you take right now? What small step could you take to move t closer to that world that you would like to be in? And it sounds like you're already doing it. Yeah, I'm already, I mean, I, I meet people in the grocery store, I tell them that they look wonderful and it's so kind what they just did. And okay. I'm constantly doing things like that. Okay. And um, I started a community garden and... Perfect. Um, I, I'm a starter. Okay. I, I'm somebody who, who wants to create the things I want to see. And I've done that for the last, I don't know, 25 years or something. But All right. Well, I, I do feel a little bit um, alone yet. Yes. You know? Well, because your birth is a lonely process. We're not even connected to our mothers, really, except by our umbilical cords, right? And so when your head is at the cervix, when your head is ready to come out, it's lonely right there. We can't imagine that there might be a whole family waiting for us when we come through there. So what I would say is keep doing what you're doing and live in trust that when we come through this, because we are going through an immense ascension process right now with the earth, Let's remember, too, that the earth is going through an ascension, not us. We came here because we wanted to be part of a planetary ascension. But we've become so human-centric, we think it's all about us. No, we're here for the ride. So you can ride the ascension process. You just keep doing what you're doing, and that community is going to be waiting for you when you come out. And they're going to catch you and wipe you off and hold you and love you and hug you and say welcome. I wanted to ask one other question. Okay. Uh, I, I was born as a breech birth, which meant they had to use forceps to pull me out. And I always had the feeling that maybe I didn't want to come. You know, maybe I came out backwards. It was like I was holding on. I, I don't want to come out here. So. Or maybe you came out feet first because you were ready to go. Hmm. <laughs> maybe you were ready to just go. Okay. Okay. Thanks. You did not have any hesitation. You, in fact, were impatient to get out. You wanted to come out feet, feet first so you could get moving. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> so I've been making a couple small steps towards feeling more supported. And the, one of the first ones is to find more like-minded friends here that are supportive of the energy healing the other is, with my family, what I did is I looked where they're coming from, and they like technology things. So I started looking at things that would look more similar to their technology things, but were related to my energy healing things. So um, I introduced them to the lasers, but just recently I introduced my sister to the idea of heart math. I was like, I think your husband will do better with his meditation if he takes some heart math. And, said it a few different times, a few different ways, and all of a sudden yesterday she said, and my workplace is offering heart math, and I signed up for a class. Excellent, excellent. Now, I would like to, to just uh, share one thing about trying to make your current community come with you to your new reality. It's a lot of energy that is probably wasted. I would say for you, if you're looking for like-minded community, start offering to do energy healing on other people. You, because you've taken these classes, so now you've got the basics. Now move into trust and let your body start doing it and offer it to people. And it's a way for you to move into that reality where people are sharing. In my future, healthcare looks like this. Everybody's a healer, everybody has a very different skill, and we all just get together in groups and we work on each other. That's my vision of healthcare in, in my future. So be careful not to waste your precious creative energy right now on trying to get people to go along with you.
We're going to lose a lot of people along this way. And that's why we have grief. Okay, we have time for one more, and then we have to go into, um, into the... Um, uh, we'll do Jay, and then we'll do you. Okay. Uh, okay, I was looking forward to the world with uh, complete transparency. And the, the little step that I'm trying to take is to create the space to have really deep conversations with people where, it's, where they can be really uh, transparent, and just uh, in a space feeling safe. Okay. Uh, uh, safe to be liberated from whatever stories and the, the truth that's innate within them. So that's a little thing that I'm trying to do. And that's, okay. where, that's where true intimacy is. Okay, I'm going to call you out on the word try. All of us. There, there is no try. There is only do, right? So when you say try, it already gives you permission to fail. That was one of the first things I learned in conscious language because I was a trier. Oh my goodness. And when I had to take that word out of my vocabulary, the sentences became too powerful and it made me very uncomfortable. So I really struggled. For, for the first year after I took my conscious language training, I could not speak. If somebody said, hi, how are you? I was like... <laughs> because what I had said in the past was no longer appropriate and I didn't have a language for, for what I want really, for what was coming out of my, so I, it took me about a year to learn how to talk again. And so um, pay attention to try because try is one of those words that tricks you into thinking that if you don't, if you fail, it's okay, all right? And when you make statements of this is where I'm going, you make statements of ownership. I look forward to being here. I do this with people. I do this. You do, you're not trying, you're doing, right? You're not trying, you're doing. Okay. Um, yeah, I just thought, I'm going to rename my bag. Just, uh, what are you, you going to call it's, it? It's, uh, just a bag. But I, I realized that during my walk, I'm angry the whole time. I see a beer can and I just want to get that guy. And, so it, I go, I'm angry the whole time I'm, I'm yeah. doing a walk, which is crazy. So. All right, he's going to rename his bag. Woohoo! Did you have... She had one more. Yeah. Okay, I think we have like time for one last thing and then we got to do the offering. I'm going to allow myself to be visible without self-judgment. I crashed a 75th birthday yesterday and she was ecstatic that I was there. So I'm willing to be visible. An elder to follow. <laughs> So what we're going to do is you're going to put your left hand down with your palm facing up and you're not going to do anything with your left hand after that. It's just going to stay in that one spot. With your right hand, you're going to go to the person on your right and you're going to feel for their chakra, their, the chakras that are in your hands. You'll feel them connect. They'll be like a little burst of energy. Everybody feel that? Woo! We got some high power. This is probably the most power I've felt in this room ever even when I've had twice as many people here. Wow. All right, so let's follow the energy around the room going from left to right. And as it's going around the room, follow it through each person. When it gets back to you, pass it through your heart, expand your heart into the field of love, and then send that energy back out. So each time around the circle, it's coming back through your heart, Oh, that feels delicious. Take a d big, deep breath of that in. And now we're going to take a big breath in, and on the exhale, we're going to take our hands as though we're holding a ball in front of our heart. So inhale. Exhale, taking that good, conscious, loving energy. You can feel it. It's like some people, it might be a grapefruit. Some, it might be a basketball. Just find your, find your ball. Thank you for sitting down. <laughs> you got it? All right. And then we're going to take a big inhale, and on the exhale, we're going to throw that ball in the middle of the room, and we're going to direct it to wherever you know this love energy is most needed. So think about where you would like to send that. Then we'll inhale, 
And on the exhale, throw it in. And there we go. Thank you all so very much. This was a pleasure.